Hey folks, welcome back to Translate Helper again today. My name is Jim Merle, and today I'm going to be sharing with you some of the answers I saw to an extremely intriguing question over on the Heart Transplant Family U.S. Support Group over the weekend. By the way, if you're not already a member of the Heart Transplant Family's U.S. Support Group and you're a heart transplant recipient or a family member of someone who is, I want to encourage you to jump over to Facebook, get involved in that, join that particular support group, because there you'll find a tremendous tremendous amount of encouragement, information, and a lot of activity, I think is really a key to that. When you have a lot of activity, that way if you need advice or need to ask a question or just need to be encouraged, when you post in that group, you'll get an immediate response from a ton of people and a wide range of views and perspectives. And I think that means a tremendous amount when you are in need of that support, as we must admit, we all are. Okay, so with that being said, this question is kind of a difficult question as far as just kind of thinking it out and facing it and having to admit that it needed to be answered. But I did think it was an extremely good question that was posted over the weekend by the user, Singles with Disabilities. Okay, so here's what the question is. It asks this. It says, what are some of the hard truths about heart transplant that people do not talk about enough? Again, what are some of the hard truths about heart transplant that people don't talk about enough. Okay, and I thought this was a very good question because when it comes to a transplant of any kind, heart transplant, that's where I'm a member there. That's what I've done before. It, it takes a lot of perspective, a lot of insight to really understand the whole thing, okay? I realize that we need to keep a very positive attitude when it comes to dealing with transplant. We've got to kind of face things with the, the best case scenario in mind. However, we also must admit that we have to keep perspective too. We have to understand and like one even said it here, and I've said it many times, transplant is a treatment and not a cure. So transplant is going to bring its own set of problems or difficulties with it. That doesn't take away from the fact that it is a wonderful thing and a definitely a wonderful blessed gift. But at the same time, just knowing and seeing in perspective uh, the things that potentially could come up in your life can make a tremendous difference when you have to face those for yourself. So I'm going to read some of the answers to this, probably not even read any of the whole answers, but kind of get around to a few of the answers. There are 88 comments that have been made on this particular post. So again, a lot of activity, but I think that it helps us to get a wide range of perspective and views from this. So question one more time, what are some of the hard truths about heart transplant that people don't talk about enough? Very first answer here comes up from a user named Jennifer. She says, first off, transplant process that is to stay in the hospital is is one that very few people have discussed and particularly she focuses on the potential for ICU delirium after transplant and I won't read the whole comment but she's not the patient she's a spouse but she's saying it's one of the most terrifying things she's ever witnessed to see her spouse deal with uh, ICU delirium and just to short explain that basically and for whatever reason, and doctors are not really sure, but for something that goes along with the whole traumatic experience of transplant, oftentimes goes along with being sedated for longer periods of time, being on heart-lung bypass machines, whatever, and then just being in a very confined, scary, scary space sometimes causes people to deal with what is termed as ICU delirium. And we're going to have a whole video on that another day, not to get too depressing about it, but it can be extremely scary because people wake up with different, uh, I don't know what you call them, but hallucinations, visions, uh, uh, just, just really not knowing what's going on and what's being done to them. I've known a number of patients that have dealt with this, even dealt with a few face-to-face -face in my days of just kind of stumbling through ICU and visiting with patients. I've crossed paths with a few transplant recipients in person that were dealing with this, and to me, it just terrified me to see it happening. I felt so sorry for these people who did not or were not able to comprehend the wonderful exchange and the gift that they've been through already and were taking a totally different view for whatever reason because of their delirium. And it's definitely something that's very difficult to deal with. Uh, just all you can really hope for if that does take place. And if she gives this type of advice that it sometimes can come about, or at least it's been suggested that it can come about because of a lack of vitamin D. So when you're in the ICU for a long period of time, that's generally kind of a dark and cold place for the most part. And so ask your doctors to assist in making sure you're, uh, supplemented well with vitamin D and other essentials that uh, can potentially help with this. I, I don't know. 
how exactly much that plays into it. But yes, I agree with you, Jennifer. ICU delirium is a real thing and can be extremely difficult. Very few people do talk about it. Another person here named Timothy uh, says med doses start out very high and over time as they determine the proper levels for you the side effects can be strong can be difficult but they do diminish after two or three months and i agree the very first doses generally speaking of medications we all go on after transplant things like tacrolimus or also known as prograf things like microphenolic acid uh cell sept and uh, particularly corticosteroid prednisone other medications that are oftentimes put together we generally start out on an extremely high dose of that and that within itself can be difficult and depending on how quickly you can get down to kind of more of a maintenance dose probably the better off you'll be but those medications start kind of doing damage immediately after transplant that's not often talked about you know in in most of the world for most of us at least you know in a daily basis we may take medications like tylenol or motrin or you know take an aspirin something like that most of the world at least maybe take some cough syrup or something for a cold every now and then but generally speaking most of the population doesn't take a medication like this on a very regular basis and so they don't have the risk they don't have the problems the issues that can arise and and that within itself is just not talked about enough that's not intended to scare anybody or to to make us think that those medications aren't worth it they are they're a means to survival but at the same time you just want to hope and pray that those doses come down quickly before any lasting damage is kind of done, particularly to your other organs. If you're a heart transplant recipient, a lot of times you'll see issues with kidneys and liver come up as a result of that. I've got cirrhosis of the liver as a result, but hey, uh, overall worth it nonetheless. Another person adds to that, Danielle says, the extreme shakes for the first month or so mainly do the medications they go away but can be demoralizing. Yes, I agree with that. Prednisone slash Prograf, other medications in combination do cause us to have extreme shakes or tremors is what they really would be defined as. I used to describe mine in imagining at least that if I had a glass of Sprite sitting on the table, if I were to stick my finger in it, the shaking that I felt, at least on the inside, I would have thought that if I had stuck my finger down in a Sprite or something, it would just fizz over and boil up. <laughs> you know, it felt like I had a vibrate or built into my hands and it made it very difficult to do things um, my grip was not what it ought to be and you know eating things on a, on a spoon or a fork you know rice or beans or or any other small thing was very difficult and almost impossible to do at times i've got a good friend as a matter of fact who for whatever reason his was extremely bad worse than mine but i remember he took some ribbing out in public on a couple of occasions where he was ex very offended by what people did and the stares that he got because he was shaking so bad we're talking like parkinson's type of look at least and that again occurs because of some of those medications and it takes a while to get over that and even until this day and i hadn't even been on prednisone in whew, nine so five years five six years now but even still today if i really tried to really steady my hand you probably can't see that on camera but still a little bit of that little twitch in there that i do not enjoy carol adds to that which is kind of similar probably because of some of the same medication she said mood changes sleep deprivation it's a total emotional roller coaster but we are so very thankful for the new life we have been given yes uh prednisone i call it the devil's drug often associated with the mood changes and the sleep deprivation very difficult to deal with uh, again uh, i have uh pictured myself in kind of a youtube video before i think the thumbnail where i've got the green face like the incredible hulk uh, you can lose a lot of friends and even family members over that stuff in the beginning. And what you've got to really do is, again, pray that that dose is tapered pretty quickly. But you've also got to hope and pray that your family members and those around you can just be patient. <laughs> you got to do what you can to control yourself, your temper maybe even. Uh, but, uh, you know, I can remember in the beginning my doctor came in. Uh, Dr. Jose Talodge came into my room and he he saw me there. I was teared up and crying and I'm not that kind of guy. And he said, I think you got a heart from a girl. I said, what are you talking about? He said, yeah, I think your donor heart was from a girl because all you do is cry now. It was just the emotional roller coaster, you know, crying one moment, mad the next, laughing the next. Mood swings can be difficult, but as the meds come down, 
things do improve. But I don't think that is talked about very much. So good suggestion right there. Eve adds to that, that that after the operation, there's a huge number of replacement problems. I like the way she put that, replacement problems that line up to cause chaos. And Yeah, it can feel that way. It can feel like uh, after transplant, there can be just kind of one thing after another, after another, after another. And that, again, is not to take away from the wonderful gift of transplant and the success of it, but it is to say that there might be things that pop up and they may be things that you've never faced in your life things that just are are difficult to face it could be the uh, the small things that turn into big things like catching the common cold maybe that affected you two to three days now you catch the common cold you're down for two weeks maybe even put in the hospital things like that can be difficult and you usually inside that first year you're going to get kind of the worst of the worst of that. And that's because your immunosuppressant medication doses are at their highest, so you're more susceptible to different things. Your body is adjusting not only from having that major, major surgery, but also adjusting to those medications. Your life itself is adjusting to the new life that you live. And so, yeah, I would agree. That's something we don't talk about enough. Number next, uh, Jennifer mentions also the shakes from the medications, the inability to sleep, very much like the last one. Anxiety awaiting biopsy results. Yeah, that's one. Um, I haven't had a biopsy now. I haven't needed a biopsy myself in about five years, I guess, the way my team laid that out. But uh, just awaiting those results are tough. Now, I am thankful that in general, my transplant team over at UAB Hospital, basically you go into clinic, you have an X-ray, echocardiogram, EKG, heart cath slash biopsy type thing going on that day. Uh, blood work, other things. Generally, my results, even for the biopsy, came back that same day. Most of those came back immediately. They were read right there by the doctors, but the biopsy took a little bit of time. But generally, it came back the same day. But I can tell you, from those moments from having the biopsy taken uh, to the moment I heard whether or not there would be any rejection, it was a pretty anxious time, uh, no doubt. And I know of a lot of people that have to wait a day or two or three for that results and Definitely a strenuous time, but nonetheless, I think that is a good point. Let's go on down. A lot of comments are added to hers. Um, Teresa says, survivor's guilt um, was a small part of her problem. The emotional roller coaster, the medications. Says, my transplant cardiologist warned me about the major mood swings, but my husband didn't listen. Yeah, kind of what we referred to earlier in, in the mood swings that come along with some of these medications. But the part I want to break out is the first phrase, survivor's guilt. I've had entire programs about the emotional roller coaster of transplant and about the guilt that does come from being the now one who's living, which in the case of a heart or lung transplant, you 100% always have a deceased donor uh, at some point. Uh, so it can be difficult. And I think I think to an extent we, we mourn and we grieve over that loss of that person, even though uh, for some of us we never even know who it is. Now, I, I happen to know my donor and donor's family and all, so I've got that experience. But even if you don't, just knowing that someone out there, you know, their life came to an end and that some family members out there are struggling because of that, there is some survivor's guilt, so I 100% understand that. Uh, that's what another person added down here. Katie said survivor's guilt 100% is a thing that's not talked about enough. Um, Jennifer Rice is one of the names, comes back and says you're trading one set of problems for another one, and they add again that same phrase, transplant is a treatment, not a cure. Isabella says, for little ones, it takes a toll on the babies. Being stuck in bed, losing your strength, uh, sleeping all day, even on and off sedation because they just can't get the start. And yeah, um, I deal with some transplant patients, not a lot, but and there are plenty. I just don't personally have the experience. But when I'm dealing with a transplant patient, particularly a pediatric patient, you know, one who's young, that's so painful. You've got the family there who is emotional and dealing with that, but you've got the child there who doesn't understand and that's so hard. And to see the struggles, uh, I think someone made a comment I didn't read earlier about their youngest, their young infant child even having a heart transplant and how that basically they just started the dosages out on a baseline and it was too much, way too much to begin with. But they don't have that data. You know, when you get to someone who's a certain height, a certain weight, a certain age, 
they got a ballpark general way of getting those medications started for you that's pretty customizable. But when you're dealing with a very small infant, it's just hard to tell when a child is that young how their body's going to react to medication. So it's hard to get those dosages right nonetheless. Uh, Desiree um, says to us that um, PTSD is something they deal with, both the recipient and the caregiver. Yes, I can agree with that. I've had entire programs, again, on PTSD and the struggles that a lot of people, including myself, to an extent, have had. And the family members can go through it as well. I don't think we give them enough recognition and enough sympathy sometimes that if you're the spouse, my wife would attest to this, if you are the spouse looking in or a parent looking in, sometimes the whole experience is more traumatic for you than it is for the patient because you're seeing everything, you're on the outside aware. Maybe the patient's not aware for whatever reason or not fully aware of what's going on, but the, the family members see that. And yes, it can leave a, a very traumatic experience in our minds and potentially something like PTSD involved and so i would encourage anyone that's gone through transplant if they feel some seemingly abnormal stress or anxiety or depression please seek out some type of a form of help and uh you can be helped by the way i know i've got a good friend corinne samora uh, i'll try to link her in the description below i did an interview with her she is actually a, a what would you call it certified qualified uh transplant uh, counselor herself she has experienced it personally and then you know helps others so she kind of got to get i've been there doing that perspective she's a huge help and also qualified and uh licensed in many states okay so the next one comes up here says uh, this is from marcella i think marcella it says uh, i find that a lot of teams do not educate their patients very well on the concept of listening to your body yeah i agree 100 percent on that um you know our, our teams are very good at, at looking at vital signs, okay? When you go into clinic and they take your take your temperature, your blood pressure, your heart rate, that sort of thing, uh, you know, the general blood work and stuff, yes, they gain a lot of information from that. And even more in depth or in, in extreme testing, like in having a, a catheterization done, a biopsy, yeah, there's a lot of insight that is gained. There are some things that are found there that won't be found any other way, but just being able to tell them about our bodies. You know, sometimes we're dealing with things personally that are, you know, either difficult or maybe even hard or impossible to, to deal with that they won't know about. So knowing your body, knowing your individual body. For me, for example, I'm looking right here at uh, my uh, Apple Watch right now. If I can get it back over to it. My heart rate right now is 111. Okay. 111 is a high heart rate. It is a high heart rate. But for me... And for many of us as heart transplant recipients, our heart rates are, are, they run high anyway. The doctors actually prefer it that way. So 111, for me, setting at rest is a little bit high. I would probably rather it didn't, but that's what it is. And so if I go into the doctor tomorrow and my heart rate's 111, I'm seated in a chair just waiting in a waiting room, uh, I wouldn't want them to get uh, kind of freaked out by that. They, they would know, but... Yes, getting to know our body, getting to know our individual situations, definitely something we need to do. And teams don't do a good enough job about that, about asking us and reminding us or teaching us how to listen to our body, how to know what's important and what is not, and how to deal with each individual situation as we go. Um, just going to read a few more. Like I said, there were 88 of these. Uh, people just keep coming back to the fact that, uh, well, this one here says, Sonia says, my daughter lost her hair. It says it grew back quickly, but still, yeah. Uh, Prograph is one of the, or Tacrolimus, same medication. One of the medications that's off in the corporate for that. And so you got to sometimes take some supplements to kind of help that out. And it, it's just strange because, you know, realistically, as, as some people would state it, some of the medications we're on are basically chemotherapy medications, okay? They're kind of chemotherapy medications anyway. And so one of the side effects you might have to that is is losing your hair. My hairline is... It slid back and thinned out a little bit through the years, and then I picked back up a little bit. I've had videos again about that. Uh, I don't know. It's just something we don't know about. We don't talk about enough. Uh, moving on down right here, um, talks about the roller coaster of it. This person right here, Tara, says uh, transplant issues arise such as skin cancer, RCO porosis, mood swings, anger, blood pressure, 
just a lot of different things again that can arise. And that's not to be seen as negative. It's just, it is a part of what it is. And so we have to be ready or prepared mentally to face those issues that may come up. Here's one. Charlotte says money. <laughs> money is something we don't talk about. When you have to go into clinic, when you have to pay for travel costs, expenses, maybe staying overnight. Uh, I know when we go for a transplant appointment, if it's a two-day, we do stay overnight. Of course, you got meals involved in that, and you got co-pays. you got bills that come in. I've had whole videos on that. It, sometimes we don't talk enough about that. You know, Some people look at it and say, well, my insurance, I got good insurance. Thankfully, you do, hopefully. But somebody says, well, I got good insurance. They're taking care of everything. Maybe so. But they're not taking care of those external expenses. They're not taking care of the, of the for today, the fuel prices of going to clinic. And my clinic's a little over an hour away, and it, it takes a half tank of gas to go over there and back, you know, that sort of thing. So you kind of got to be prepared for that. Uh, someone who goes on to make suggestions about that, particularly for children, a lot of times they're Ronald McDonald houses. They're other low-cost low, low Housing that is available specifically for transplant patients, sometimes even free. Um, just check into that. Here's one. I'll, I'll end on this one here. Jessica says, one of the things we don't talk about is that sometimes transplant doesn't always work. And that is extremely hard uh, to think about. Um, she mentions specifically the passing of her child. Uh, or a granddaughter, granddaughter here who received a transplant nine months, passed away at 14 months. Transplant doesn't always work. It's not always the success story that we would hope that it is. I think to a point it always is successful, but it's not always successful to the point and to the direction that we would want it to be. So it can be difficult um, right here. Man. I was going to end on that, but I really don't want to. Here's one. Uh, Brenda says, 29 years ago, I was found pregnant. My daughter was dying inside of me, delivered at 38 weeks, had a C-section, was put on the heart transplant list the day she was born. At six weeks old, she received a heart transplant. And now, I'm going to skip through here, now she's 28 years old, has a child herself. And so, yeah, there's a story that boils itself out in a very positive way. Nonetheless, there are 88 of these. I said it a few times. We're not going through any more. That's about it. Migraine stands out. Um, that's just uh, What are we saying here? I'm going to close this up. What are we saying? We are saying that heart transplant or any transplant in that case comes with its challenges. But, folks, it is still a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful gift. And to me, one of the most important, the most uh, handy things about the process and, and what I enjoy doing and what these people are doing through this post is they're helping to inform and to educate one another and to encourage and to motivate one another through this process, and it only makes things better. Again, uh, I would love to hear your comments. If you want to continue this discussion, my comment section is open. Go ahead and continue this discussion here. And uh, tell me what are some of the things that you think should be talked about more. I think what I'm going to do in the next few weeks is continue to go back through this list and kind of expand on some of these and maybe have entire programs about a few of them because I think it is something that we do need to discuss more. And even after over 800 videos, I don't think I've even touched top side or bottom of getting to everything. So we're going to keep on doing this. Thanks so much for joining me. Until next time, certainly stay stronger, friend.